Before I get into talking about today's topic, which is what happened to Pontiac, and bring up to speed on some of the other things that are going on around the shop. Josh started a new job, so he's been gone for a couple of days. He should be here tonight. But everything's back together again here now. The exhaust manifolds are on it, the new steering box is in it, the training is in it all buttoned up. So there's just some odds and ends that need to be addressed, and we'll take care of that tonight and bring up to speed on this car early next week. We'll, we'll take it out and romp it around a little bit. Slaghammer. I've been working on Slaghammer. So we re-ringed it. We re ring number six and number eight on this. Luckily with this car, everything can be done in the car. So it was a really quick job. We just popped off the other cylinder head, dropped the pan, and re ring number six and eight. And you guys could see the results. It was way more responsive and powerful. So we're good to go with that. And now she's on a diet. Put her on a scale, ready to run with two gallons of gas in the tank, and I had 3,200 3, pounds, 3,199. So right now I'm down to uh, 3,185, and the goal here is to pull another five pounds out of the car. That's our current current goal, right? Eventually, I'd like to get this thing down into the 3,000 pound even range, ready to run. But for right now, we're just shooting for 3,180. We have five pounds left to go. I've been pulling out all kinds of like extraneous extra metal and bits and so on and so forth. So, all little things like this stuff all adds up. All right, so that's what I'm doing with that. Now, yesterday's video, we were talking about how Chevrolet climbed to the top of the aftermarket and performance heap. And we were talking about how during the early evolutionary period of the muscle car era, so from let's say 1962, 63 to like 1969, 1970, there were certain design flaws in certain cars that kept them from rising to the top of the heap, gaining the street cred necessary for widespread acceptance for major builds that would lead the aftermarket to embrace those brands. So we talked about the, the Mopar oil pan. We use this as the example. And if you're not, if you're curious about what we're talking about, you didn't see the video, just Kathy will put a link to it someplace, wherever she puts a link, over here. She'll put a link to it over here. So that was that. The premise of that video was the early formative years. A lot of guys, a lot of comments were about um, Chevrolet interchangeability, how one, bolt, one bell housing fits big block, small block, six cylinder, even the four cylinders that they're using the Novas. There are a lot of excellent qualities built into the Chevrolet platform. I've, you've, you'll never ever hear me say a bad word about Chevys. I recognize the small block Chevy as the mechanical wonder that it is. And the big block Chevy, no question about it, inch for inch, pound for pound, it is the best normally aspirated motor ever produced. Chrysler came close with the ball stud Hemi, which never saw production. Had the ball stud Hemi actually gone into production, I believe that it would have given the big block a run for the money and probably surpassed it because it was superior on the bottom end. But that's, that's all either here nor there. The point is that evolutionary period, before Chevrolet had a stranglehold on the aftermarket industry and grew to the, to the monster that it is today in terms of aftermarket support and performance, before interchangeability, before all of these things that, that are the attributes people currently assign to Chevrolet. Those things didn't exist. During the 1960s, Chevrolet had an extremely low profile in terms of performance. Um, and like I said, interchangeability wasn't an issue yet. Nobody was making these swaps and, and putting big small block Chevys in everything. It was still the Wild West during the 1960s. So, and that's the period that we're talking about. So we talked about why Chrysler had its issue, the bean counting, the, 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 uh, the cost saving measure of using that singular engine compartment was designed around the slant six and trying to make V8s 
function correctly in a drag racing environment. And again, we were talking about early days, before there were deep pans, before there were all of the, the, the things that we take for granted today. We're talking about a guy who buys a car off the showroom floor, it's got the stock oil pan, stock everything, hot rods it, and then gets it down into that low 12 second, high 11 second zone, where the acceleration forces out overpower its ability to send oil back to the, the pickup. Ford's had the same issue. Later on, obviously, these, these things were addressed and somewhat corrected. And by the way, the reason why Chrysler couldn't put a deeper pin on those engines is because of the K-frame clearance. The K-frame, the, 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 the five-quart pin, the normal five-quart pin found on big block regular 383s, 440s, is even with the bottom of the K-frame. To put a deeper pan on there, you have to go below the level of the K-frame. And that's why 426 Hemi and six-pack cars, they came with deeper pans, but they also had a skid plate on the K-frame to protect that bottom of the pan. So things were, Chrysler did make steps to correct this issue as evolution went on, but it still left a bad taste in people's mouths. So let's talk about Pontiac because Pontiac, by all rights, should have been the choice for the aftermarket to embrace, based on the fact that during that period of time, the 1960s, Pontiac was the performance division. It was, the, I mean, arguably the GTO was the first muscle car. It's not, it wasn't quite the first muscle car, but it was the first image car. It was the first one that really caught on. And then later on, you had the Firebirds and the Trans Ams. And, so, and their, their whole line was based on performance and the performance image. So you would think that Pontiac would have risen to the top of the heap and the aftermarket circa 1970 or so when it embraced Chevy the way it did, that the aftermarket would have embraced Pontiac. But it didn't. Why? Right? The performance division, the, the one that built the image cars and had arguably some of the stoutest factory stock performance cars and factory race cars, remember the Super Duty Catalinas all, you would think that that would have been a division that everybody would have, would have embraced. But it was a design flaw. It was a design flaw that kept it from going to the top. So let's talk about Pontiac for a minute. And this is something I can actually talk about because I, see, I never mentioned it on this channel, but for four years, from 1985 to 1988, I was the technical editor for high-performance Pontiac magazine. So not only was I the technical editor, but I wrote countless articles on Pontiac engines and Pontiac performance. So it's something I'm familiar with. Pontiac, during the 1960s, as I said, was the performance division. They were the, that was, they were, they were all about performance and performance image. But they had a problem with street cred. Now, the, the problem with street cred wasn't, wasn't among people who just bought regular stock muscle cars and did stock muscle car things with them, but people who actually went out and stepped on these things. Pontiacs had a fatal flaw, and it was in the connecting rod. This, this is a Chrysler connecting rod. I'm just holding it as a, I don't know, a prop. Beginning in 1963, with the 389 engines, Pontiac went to a cast rod. Okay. Every other manufacturer was using forged rods at the time. And Pontiac, for whatever reason, decided that they were going to use what they called an armor cast connecting rods. All right. Here's what happened with these things. The rods in normal service were fine, right? So in other words, like you buy a, a 400 GOAT or a 389 Tri-Power GTO or whatever it happened to be. And within the performance envelope that they were designed to work in, so let's say a 14 second car off the showroom floor and you hop it up a little bit, now you got something to run low 13s, high 12s, stout performance for the era. Once you got to that kind of power level, RPM and power, the rods would fail. Everybody has had bad rods. The Chrysler oiling system led to spun bearings, which would tear up the bottom end of the rod. 
Ford's the same problem. Somebody in the comments said, oh, you know, Ford's never had oiling system problems. Ford's are notorious for oiling system problems. And we're not even talking about the FE with that weird primary oiling that goes behind the cam bearing and all. But the front sump Ford oil pan, tear apart any Ford engine from that era that's got more than 100,000 miles on it, and you'll see very distinct wear patterns on the bearings. It's common, it's like universal. You see more wear, more uh, normal wear, what we could be considered normal wear. In other words, like it's you know, not damaged for high RPM use or oil starvation, but just quote normal wear. You'll see more of it on Ford engines than you will on any other. So, but that's besides the point. We're talking about Pontiacs now. So, Chrysler had its oil starvation issues, which would cause a spun bearing, and if neglected or pushed beyond its limits, it would break the bottom end of the rod. They would break it at the rod bolts, it would break the cap, whatever. Pontiacs, on the other hand, because of the cast rod, once you got into that, let's say, 12 second zone, right? And, and none of these issues really show themselves until you're in that range. Once you got a Pontiac into the 12 second zone, the rods became a real liability. And they would just snap. And when they would snap, they would tear everything up. They'd break right here on the beam section of the rod. And there was nothing you could do about it. You could, do, do, I mean, really back then all you could do was just polish rods. It was, it was early, early hot rodders used a box connecting rods. They would actually take this part and, and weld a piece of sheet steel on either side to box them in. And a lot of Pontiacs did that. But, or Pontiac racers, people, you know, people who messed with Pontiacs did that. But that armor cast connecting rod and their failures, all right. There's a performance pyramid. And this is something that Chrysler talked about when they were, when they were doing the Roadrunner, when they were uh, engineering the Roadrunner, or when they were ready, they were ready to market the Roadrunner. And they saw that the professional racer was at the top of the pyramid. And then th uh, the next rung down were hardcore uh, hobby racers. And the next row down were um, enthusiasts who go who, who will go a little bit further than, than just stock and put a cam and headers and blah, 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 all of those parts. And then at the very bottom and the biggest, biggest uh, uh, chunk of population was people who just emulated whatever the people on the top were. And those were the guys who would just go to the showroom and buy a car and this is what they're gonna run. So Pontiac ran into a problem with that pyramid beginning in around 1964, 1965. They went to those cast connecting rods and very few racers were able to make them work. See, Pontiac flooded that bottom row with, with excellent cars, beautiful cars, excellent interiors, excellent, excellent everything, but didn't give those people buying those cars the tools to attain the next levels of the pyramid, which would be a good solid connecting rod. And it was the common thing for somebody to hop up a Pontiac and get into that 12 second at high, high 11, 12 second zone and just start grenading rods. That turned the upper levels of the pyramid off. And so the lower levels of the pyramid, they didn't go that far. They just drove their cars and, and didn't bother spending the money on them that Chevrolet and even Chrysler guys, and even Ford guys did. And so the aftermarket, even though Pontiac had that image, the aftermarket pretty much turned its back on Pontiac and only offered the, the slightest things for it, you know, headers and intake manifolds and stuff like that. They didn't really go that far. Because of that flaw in the connecting rods, the engines were never really adapted and, and exploited for racing. There were exceptions. And here's the thing about Pontiac. Nobody supplied their racers with more hardcore Really exotic stuff. I spent I spent a weekend over at Arnie Beswick's place this was back in the 1990s, and he was showing me parts that Pontiac had cast specifically for him, and all aluminum. Actually, he had a couple of them. All aluminum Ram Air five blocks, Ram Air five heads, all sorts of all sorts of exotica with factory Pontiac casting numbers on it that were offered to racers to try to keep to that, that Pontiac performance image up there. But even Arnie, as, as hardcore Pontiac as he was, couldn't compete with it 
because there were still breakage issues. There were oil supply issues because of the, the way the Pontiac mains were oiled. And so even he, in 1971, went to Chrysler. Tried everything he possibly could. He was a dedicated Pontiac guy. But what are you gonna do? The design flaws inside the engine. But this is where the Chevrolet really gained a stranglehold on the aftermarket. And like I says, things like the interchangeability that we talk about, and yeah, all that is valid, but it all came after the fact. In 1969, 1970, when that, that shift uh, the aftermarket uh, saturation of the Chevrolet, those things didn't really exist yet. People weren't really interchanging things in 1966, 1967. They'd buy what they had and they'd race with what they had, or they'd screw around with what they had. That is where Chevrolet took the advantage. And this is what killed, Pon I don't want to say killed Pontiac, but really put a damper on Pontiac and kind of, they, they faded as time went on, as the years went on, especially into the 1980s, 1990s, Pontiac faded. That's why. It was funny, I'll tell you a quick funny story. We were, uh, it was 1978, and we were hanging out on Highland Boulevard. So I'm, I'm from Staten Island, right? And we were hanging out at a place called H&L Olds. This was on a, on a Thursday night. And all the, all the hot rod guys would gather at this H&L Olds parking lot and hang out and choose off for races and so on and so forth. And there were probably, I don't know, 30 cars in the parking lot and, and you know, 100 people or so. And we're milling around, we're all talking. And uh, we hear off in the distance, now it's late, there's no traffic, and we hear off in the distance, a whine, a blower whine, right? So right away, everybody's talking about, oh, that's that guy with the GTO, he just put a blower on his car. And we hear this thing, it's off in the distance. It's, Wee! All right, so now, no, nobody's saying anything, and we're all just watching or paying attention. And here comes this goat, big honking blower sticking out of the hood, and we're all like, wow. And he pulls to the traffic light, the light is red, and there's silence among everybody. And we're all watching, we're focusing on this car. And he knows that we're watching it, so he's gonna put on a show. So the light turns green, and he flat foots it, and blows the bottom end of the engine. <laughs> I'll never, I will never forget that. Just puked the whole bottom end of the engine to the oil pan. And there were broken chunks of connecting rod everywhere. What are you going to do? So, I hope you guys got something out of that. I do love Pontiacs. You know, so don't, don't get the wrong idea. I'm not dissing Pontiacs. I'm just telling it like it is. Chrysler had its design flaws. Pontiac had its design flaws. Everybody had design flaws. Chevy had fewer design flaws than everybody else. I'll see you tomorrow. Hey, Crystal. Yes. Listen, we got a problem. What's up? We're not making enough for these shirts. Okay. Right? What are we selling them for? Like Twenty bucks? Yeah. It's not enough. It's not enough. Oh. You know why? You know, I'll tell you what. It's basic economics. Yeah. Because these shirts are like. You make them. I mean, you just sit here all day and all night and just assembly line these shirts. So there's a lot of them. Right. And we can only get so much for a renewable commodity like that. Right. All right. Well, here's what we got to do, right? We oh, gotta, my we God. Gotta, yeah. We got to burn the inventory. We got to torch the inventory that we've got. Oh, my God. All right? <laughs> so, yeah. We got to torch the inventory so that we can get more for the shirts that we have. Instead of getting $20 for a shirt, we can get forty or 50000 for them if there's only like, let's say, three. Right. Okay? okay. Because then you're going to have like, like Dubai people are going to be bidding for them and so on and so on. You see what I'm saying? Sure. All right. Get these shirts. Well, that's really burning. <laughs> oh, <my goodness. laughs> and the ones that we save, we sell them as fire starters. Oh, right, like yeah. kindling, you know, people with fireplaces, the holiday season is coming, holiday they want to lay it there. For, so, yes, we sell them these shirts, and there you go. Perfect. Okay, so, burn all but three, and then we'll sell the blanks. Okay. All right, we'll be rich before you know it, baby. Get back to work.